Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm sure we have some, some people in the waiting room that will, will join us momentarily. Um, uh, we'll get started here in just a minute. Um, while we're getting started, I'm going to put up our welcome banner, which is not open. Um, just one second. See, there's always a glitch when you, when you do a new event. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, well, it looks like we have a couple of people join, who have joined, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Hummingbird Hour. Uh, this is our one year anniversary of Hummingbird Humanity. Um, which is very exciting! Yay! Um, I am uh, I'm delighted to uh, to to kick off this this hummingbird hour series. Um, and uh, you know, for those of you who um, might prefer to experience the session uh, with closed captioning, uh, the the we, the program is being re recorded today, and closed captioning will be available on future on demand viewing on our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll also release uh, the transcript, and we put it on our website. Um, so thank you for being with us today. So I'm going to stop the share here and we're going to dive in to a great conversation. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, my first guest and then I'm going to ask him to do some formal formal welcomes that he uses at his firm Fearless Communicators. Um, so the reason I wanted it, so Eduardo Placer is the founder of Fearless Communicators, for those of you who don't know, but everyone knows Eduardo. Uh, he is a joy and a light. Um, and um, Eduardo was our first guest on Hope, Heart, and the Human Spirit, uh, the series, the conversation series we had last year, um, which we launched on May 6th of 2020. Um, it was a time of, of just freedom and abandon um, for everyone. Uh, no, it was a, it was a difficult time and um, for, for so many of us uh, as we were all navigating life in the pandemic. And uh, Eduardo um, and it was it was one of my mentors or is one of my mentors. And he uh, I was talking to him about this idea that I had of having this conversation series. And I'm like, I need to know this and I need to know this and I need to know this. And he says, Brian, you're ready. Let's just put the date on the on the calendar. Um, and so he was my first guest for Hope Heart and the Human Spirit. So Eduardo, I'm delighted that you're here with us today. I, I feel unbelievably grateful uh, to be uh, marking time with you in this moment. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we've, we, it's, we've come a long way over the last year, and today we're going to talk about some of that journey. Um, so before we do some that, the, the, invite you to do your formal um, welcomes, uh, I wanted to make sure I mentioned Ben Green, uh, who is uh, with us today. Um, and I promised Ben that I would that he wasn't going to be on screen today, and yet here he is. Um, so I, uh, so Ben, I'm going to put you into the the attendee group um, for uh, for the session, and um, thank you for being with us. And so Ben will be helping with questions that you might have and he will also be adding some some links to the chat so um, feel free to um, to ping Ben if you have anything that you might need so Ben thanks for being out with us okie doke so Eduardo Eduardo would you would you kick us off formally uh, with the, the 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 way you kick off your fearless communicator events beautiful thank you for that Brian so as a tradition and as a ritual, there, there are three things that we do before we start any of our fearless events. And I'm gonna do those as, as we lead into this conversation and kind of kick off the series, Brian. Um, the first thing that we do is uh, an acknowledgement of the elder uh, and a requesting of permission from the elders in our community to begin. And uh, I wanna begin by acknowledging the elders in our community and bowing to them, paying tribute, homage, to them and really centering their wisdom, their knowledge, their insight, uh, and uh, their leadership, and begin by acknowledging that. Uh, the second thing is a land acknowledgement. And uh, we've been doing it with Fearless Communicators, I want to say since maybe 2017 or 2018. Uh, part of our global work takes us to Australia, and in Australia, it's part of the course. Uh, and the first time I witnessed a land, land acknowledgement, I was so moved and thought we need to start bringing that to all our, our, our events in the US. I know in Canada, they do it with more frequency, 
but it's not something that has been really seen very much in the US. And I think now it's, it's emerging. And I think Ben is gonna put in the chat uh, a link. It's called nativeland.ca. And if you type in your address uh, there, it'll tell you the name of the indigenous tribe uh, to the best of their ability. They don't claim to be the, 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 the it is just a site. Right, but it'll give you a cue into uh, the indigenous land that you're standing on. So uh, as we are connecting and circle and yarning, telling stories and being in community together, uh, I want to acknowledge that standing in the East Village of New York uh, on the island of Manhattan, uh, I'm a guest on Muncie Lenape land and I want to acknowledge ancestors and elders that are past, present and emerging. And then if people do know the name of the land, uh, the name of the indigenous tribe on whose land they are standing, you know, we'll just take a moment uh, to pay respect and uh, homage to them. And then uh, feel free to also enter that in the chat. And then the, the third thing is, uh, I think just marking again time, uh, the importance in this moment for myself uh, as a queer Latinx, uh, male identifying child of immigrants who is both bilingual and bicultural uh, to name the water that we are swimming in. I love that you're doing that as you're drinking water, <laughs> right? Uh, yes, drinking the water. Hi, Brian Vaught. It's great to see you. I see Brian Vaught in the chat. Uh, so it, it's important to name the, the prevalence and the existence of structural institutional racism, misogyny, ableism, ageism, and LGBTQ plus phobia. And my personal commitment in this lifetime is to use my voice, my body, and my story in the dismantling of those institutions to ensure justice, equity, and freedom for all. I love that. I love that. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you. Well, I'm so, so delighted that you're here with us um, today. We, uh, I, I, I mentioned a few, couple of these, uh, these tidbits here in the, in the opening. I wanted to make sure that we, we had some hooks in there right at the very beginning uh, to get people uh, to engage. Uh, Eduardo, um, at, at his firm, Fearless Communicators, works with uh, public speakers and thought leaders and, um, and helping, um, helping them amplify their voices, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a passion that Eduardo and I both share we do it through different lenses um or do mechan different mechanisms um but it's it's i just love the fearless communicators community and uh and uh feel like i was i've been so embraced by your community and and so in in different ways of just being part of just the larger community but also being going to have the chance to go through one of your programs uh which was really just phenomenal something that i've always loved about um, fearless communicators and my time in your community it is really indicative of, of the the um, the formal openings or welcomes that you just shared with us where you honor uh, different communities and you honor uh, different individuals and honor the context we're in I'm curious where that comes from for you because when I think about a so many so much of the communications firm space that I'm aware of tends to be sort of consistent with white patriarchy and um, and and that sort of world. And so you're like on the, in another space altogether. So where did that come from for you? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I think that part of it is my own healing, right? I think that uh, one of the things that I've discovered in the privilege of the work that I get to do uh, and that our company gets to lead is is the realization that the way we teach leadership, the way we teach communication, the way we teach presentation is all inherently patriarchal and colonial. So anyone who is not straight white male cisgender power is forced into performing that to perform success, right? Now, what we have also, and we have ripples of it in the landscape is this whole conversation around authenticity, right? But authenticity, let's be honest, is never celebrated, right? All of our primal upbringing is don't be authentic, conform, right? And uh, I'm, I'm very clear that for myself, you know, as a young, uh, before I even knew that I was gay, you know, uh, but I knew there was something different, right? As a child growing up in Miami, Florida, to Cuban parents, immigrant parents with an identical, identical twin brother who's straight, 
was that I knew that the truth of who I was was something that my community could not hold. So what I had to do was lie. Nobody told me to lie, but I knew instinctively that the only thing I could do to survive was to lie. Now, all of the framing that you get from parents and teachers and everything is, don't tell a lie. It's from the 10 commandments, <laughs> don't tell a lie. There's a lot of confession about that, but then still knowing inherently that, that the truth was unsafe. And I just don't think that tension, even though I've been out for over 18 years, I, I mean, well, I've been out since I was 18, so over 20 years, right? That almost 25 years, that the, that that tension, that, 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 that is never gone. Like it's ingrained in my body. And, and that I was taught to perform, to be something other than who I was, to make my parents feel comfortable, to make my family feel comfortable, to have everyone else feel comfortable. And I'm not doing that anymore, right? And I know that in the, the sharing of that, I'm not the only person who's experienced that. And I think that there is an array of trauma. I mean, we often say the statistic is that 76% of people suffer from speech anxiety. And I believe everybody else lies, right? So at the root, we're all dealing with some silencing or shaming about the truth of who we are. Uh, and I think to, to create the space of speaking as a space that's inviting, a space that is inclusive, a space that is open, a space that isn't punitive, right? I mean, imagine like if when I would, like if someone were to ask a question, everyone would raise their hands to speak because people didn't have that silencer that was like, that's stupid or nobody's going to care or you sound weird or you're strange or you speak funny or there's something weird with the timbre of your voice, right? And then acknowledging that also in the work that we do, like we have a lot of clients who I think are in some healing. So they come to us with something to fix. I have an accent or I, uh, um, I need to take up more space or I need to be louder or I need to, uh, you know, I don't like the way that my voice sounds, right? And that's oftentimes gay men, right? Because of the trace of the femininity perhaps in their voice that is an indicator or a trigger or like a hint to people that may be a little gay or they were picked on or bullied, right? And, or someone's an immigrant and they have an accent and they wanna change that, or they're a woman and they, they have a high pitched voice and they feel that in order to be successful, they have to deepen their voice. That something inherently has a shift or change and inviting that there's absolutely nothing to fix. There is nothing wrong. You are perfect, you are whole, you are complete. And how do you discover power, leadership, as an inside out job, not as a performance, not as, as an externalization, but as an opportunity to really get grounded in the truth of who you are, how that emanates through the cellular muscle fibers of your own being in connection with your breath and your body, uh, and, and then communicating not about you, but through you in service to other people. Like it ultimately isn't about you. And when we remember is when someone's like, wow, that was magical because like that person disappeared and you just were in an experience. That's what we want. Um, so, so I think all of the framing and sourcing is, is, has emerged from, I think my own personal experience and then the privilege of being of service to the people that we get to be of service to and, and the continued healing of it because we're all healing from it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And so much of that, of course, resonates with me. And it, it reminds me of a, a story that I don't think I've, I've shared with you of, um, are you, but you might have, or you might have heard it in, in one of our, the spaces we've been in together when, when I started doing training, uh, delivering training programs in my first HR job. Uh, so, you know, the story of where I, you know, I, I went in the closet when I started HR and then I had a mentor who helped me come out. 
had another mentor there who was a gay man who uh, was one of our, our lead trainers um, and Red Lobster. And he, um, he helped me learn how to do some of the training programs that I had to start delivering. And I remember being terrified that people would figure out I was gay in front of that room. Um, and uh, Tom, Tom Boyko, who is the uh, is the was that was that individual who helped me, who was mentoring me and helping me. He was a um, I'll, I'll say flamboyant uh, gay man, yeah. and, uh, yeah. fabulous and fantastic, and people adored him. And he said, like, just if you, you need to bring your whole self, because that's how you engage the room. When you're hiding, it does, that's where you disconnect. Well, and it's so, and I, I want to acknowledge that it takes risk. And again, it's a victory over the past because in second grade, we were not rewarded for that. Mm. In ninth grade, we were not rewarded for that. In college, we were not rewarded for that, right? So it's like all of your coding is like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And yet when you witness someone aligned, unapologetic, effusive in their body, uh, truth telling, you know, alive, you're just like, whatever that is, I love, right? And, you know, and that's why I say that there, there, it is a risk. It is not easy. I think people think it's easy to be authentic. It's not. I think for me, it's extremely painful. Like every time I do it, it's painful. It hurts. It's exhausting. I am depleted. And yet it is always uh, another notch in a continued healing around my primal shame, which the root of is that I'm a gay man and that I can't separate myself from that. That is there. That was in the frame of the culture that I was raised. Uh, and, and within that darkness, there's also immense pride, right? So there's the yin and the yang, like I think, but they like pride exists in a context of shame, right? Uh, so, so it is in relationship to that power uh, resists in relationship to weakness, right? So I can, you know, or 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 or, or success with failure, right? It, it's it's a, they're together, right? And I think that uh, that is it's useful to think of those um, in our own speaking. Yeah, I, I, I there's a, a colleague that I um, had a, the, the opportunity to work with a fair amount last year, um, Audrey McGuckin, and she talks about the the two what feel like diverging realities can be true at the same time. Um, yeah. Well, let's be really gay for a second, Brian McComb. I can talk about <laughs> I'm always sorry, I'm always grateful. A little Sondheim, little Sondheim, a little Sondheim, and I think that the, the power of ambivalence, like I never really got it. You know, but I think the pandemic was something that was uh, like, I can feel like unbelievable, like fear and gratitude at the same time, right? Like, like, I guess the extremeness of that circumstance, you know, which, you know, impacted billions of people on the planet at the same time, right? That we, there was this collective experience of, of collective pain that like, like I could live in the complexity we could. And I think what's emerging, which I think is really beautiful, um, specifically in the DE&I space, as well as we continue to make space for our non-binary and non-conforming siblings is the way that we can just disrupt this idea of binariness, right? That we can have an and, it, it doesn't have to be an either or, right? That, that it can be complicated, that our existence is complicated. It's not simple, right? And that we can, find richness and texture and uh, and complexity beautiful and interesting and compelling and uh, and alive. And we can do so and listen to that and invite that with grace and with curiosity and love. And uh, I think that being a gay man and my own experiences in the framing of, of, of that, uh, how my brain make up everything, <laughs> I think gave me a gift of empathy Right, and I think the I think that it's powerful in this moment for the cisgender, gay, and lesbian uh, people who've reached a seat at the table, perhaps to think that we actually haven't reached equality; we, we've reached privilege, right? And how are we using our privilege in support of 
you know, the B, the Q, the I, the A, the two, the plus, right? The T, like how do we continue to make room uh, at the table for uh, the people in our, in our community? And, uh, and I think it, it's not like, well, now I'm here, it's over, but it's, it's never over, right? And we can continue uh, to just be graceful and loving uh, because, because I think that that was shown to me you know, and I think that uh, that I was granted and gifted opportunities because people were that way with me, and I can I can still take now the privileges that I have and use that in service of other people. Leave the door open behind you. Always, yeah, absolutely. Whenever God closes a door, somewhere He opens a window. A window. I love yeah. It. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, and and so, so you know that's certainly a commitment that I share as well, and something that as I have really. Um, as I stepped into this D, the DEI work. So I've, I've always worked with, you know, as an HR and company cultures and employee experience. And those of us that were others have always been important to me. Um, and then I formally stepped into the work a, a handful of years ago. Uh, and I, I, I think one of the earlier ahas for me as I started to understand the whys behind this work, and that's an ongoing learning, is uh, yes, as a gay man and a person with disability, I have I have experienced what it feels like to be another. And I also have a significant amount of privilege because I, I'm a white cisgender man. Um, and wh whether people figure out or I'm gay or not, I, I sort of leave that to the side, but, um, but like I have privilege. And so I have to, I have a responsibility, I believe, to use that privilege to, to benefit others. And when you speak about the, the community, the non-binary community and the gender queer community, you have some fun language, which you use actually in the opening too. All the time. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, and part of it is I'm an English major. I'm also bilingual and bicultural. Like my first language is Spanish. I'm always interested in language. I was a Shakespearean actor. So, you know, trained in, in the use of language. And one of the greatest inventors of language is Shakespeare. He just made it up. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I think there's a way, again, patriarchy, colonialism, that we become attached and ingrained and think this is it and this is the only way. And I think it's important to play with language, that it's ever emerging and evolving, that language is a tool that we have to make sense of the world that we're in. And the world that we're in is not stuck in a, in a world book encyclopedia or a Britannica encyclopedia book. It is alive and emerging. And I think that there are ways that we can play with it. So. You know, I say uh, now I kind of I, I I kind of the list. I don't I, I don't just say history. I say history, history, their history. <laughs> like I just combine all of that. And and I notice that just in the space of play, instead of saying amen, like I say a them. You know, as and sometimes people are like, what are you saying? They're not necessarily getting it until they get a little later, and they're like, oh my god, I love that. And uh, I think it's just it's just subtle ways that we can play. You know, I. I uh, and another word that, that I'm playing with making up right now uh, is um, in English, and I'm a very proud gunkle. So I, I have uh, four nieces and a nephew, and, and being a gay uncle is like one of the biggest joys. I, I know that for me, in my truth and my reality, I don't see myself being a parent and having children. That's not what I feel like I'm called in this lifetime to do. Uh, however, I'm a fabulous uncle, and having a gunkle is like the best or being a gunkle is the best and my nieces all have show tinnitus and it's amazing. But there isn't a word for gunkle in Spanish. So I was like, how can we create one? So I came up with guillo, a gay tío. <laughs> so, so now like we have the gunkle version in Spanish, the guillo. So, uh, and I just think that that level of play and fun can be disarming, it's political and, uh, and playful. And, and I think that we can continue to find ways to disrupt that. I also have privilege to do that, right? So I, I acknowledge that I have privilege to do that. And that's one of the ways in which I use my privilege and my platform to disrupt and play in that way. And and I I, um, I don't know if I've ever asked you this, but I'm curious because one of the, um, I, I, as I've shared, I feel like I have a responsibility to, to be a champion for others and use my privilege for good. And I'm committed to changing the world. And to do those things, that means I have to be my authentic self. I like that's I, that's a choice I make, but I but and I have to share my stories. And some of my stories come with some fear and anxiety yeah. um, about about some of you know because I don't know how people are going to receive those those messages or 
if I have to challenge the status quo, which I believe is essential. I, you know, I love the quote, the system isn't broken, it was built this way. So we have to like tear it down. Um, but that's that that means I'm making other people at the very least uncomfortable. Um, and and that might have at moments consequences. Um, and uh, I'm okay with that. I've accepted that as my journey. How, how do you manage through some of those 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 fears that that come with doing the work that is challenging the status quo? Well, it's interesting. I don't find my, I don't think that I am, I'm not, I'm not someone who thrives on confrontation. Hmm. Uh, and I know there's some people who are confrontation, confrontational and thrive on confrontation. And we need definitely people in the movement in the world that are confrontational and thrive on that. But I don't think all of us are meant to be confrontational. And I guess in the space of non-binariness, there are many ways, right? And that's one way and an effective way and a powerful way. And there are other strategies that people have. Um, for me, uh, I, don't, I, I do believe that discomfort is a powerful tool, right? Because what discomfort does is it provides tension. And what happens is when there's tension, I listen, right? Now, eventually, as a speaker, right, what we're looking to is release the tension. Right now, that doesn't mean that we're skipping with rainbows and unicorns and having, you know, you know, a gay float parade, <laughs> you know, with confetti and then, yeah, everything's amazing. But but I'm being responsible for how I'm leaving people. And I think sometimes people speak and they're not responsible for the impact or how they're leaving people. And I think it's important to consider that. And I think if you want to leave people pissed and angry, awesome, you did that. That was your that's what you intended to do. Right. And I think that having a focus always on your audience is important. Who is my audience and how do I want them to feel, right? And uh, I remember there was a, uh, I was speaking at a, uh, I was teaching at Baruch College in, uh, in New York City, which has a lot of first generation immigrants, right? So, or, or first generation or immigrants. So they're from Eastern Europe or they're from the Middle East or they're from North Africa or they're from, all over the place, Central South America. I mean, they're literally from all over the place. And uh, I, there was a public speaking uh, faculty member who had me come in to do this workshop that I do on hacking the fear of public speaking, which is all about being in your body and all that other stuff. And I, when I come in, it's full on, like people are making sounds, they're in their body, it's playful, and I am not apologetic of who I am, right? And I could tell that there was some snickering and like some like the 18 year old bro culture was kind of in the in the corner kind of like doing a side eye kind of thing in the jiggy and then what happened is that one of the things that I talk about is what is your biggest fear when you're speaking right and i want to be responsible with the people that are listening that i'm going to say something that's really horrible but I, I want to I let you know that I'm saying that in advance and I'm going to be responsible for it. But this is how I used it and used the discomfort. So what I said to them is, um, so we all have fears when we're speaking. Most people talk about they're afraid of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, not being good enough, not smart enough. My biggest fear is that some of you think that I'm a faggot. And if you're thinking you're that, you're thinking that, you're right, I am. Yes, let's move on, right? And all of a sudden you could hear like a pin drop And what happened is there was a narrative that was happening in private that I now took control of and I named it. And I, by naming it, I disappeared it and they were all in it with me. And I completely shifted the power dynamic in the room. Right? And that, you know, and I, I, my origin story is about being gay. It's about second grade show and tell and outing myself in front of my classmates in second grade. And I find myself in places all over the world where I tell that story, where I have to gauge, is this a safe place for me to tell that story? Is it safe for me to out myself in Ramallah, in Palestine? Is it safe to out myself in Jerusalem for a group of Orthodox Jewish women? Like the moment that I name myself and out myself, do I now lose something in their listening that has them now out of it 
and actually not engage because the truth of who I am has now disrupted their ability to experience this because of their bias or judgment or whatever, right? So, uh, and, you know, I, I facilitated events at, like the Muslim Jewish conference. I'm not Muslim and I'm not Jewish, you know, but, you know, and, you know, around public speaking and entrepreneurship and all that other stuff, right? So uh, I, I was a faculty member at, a, again, I'm, I'm, for some reason I'm talking about Israel, but I <laughs> at a university in Israel, which is at the center of like, uh, it was a medical uh, MBA program. So it was medicine, military, business, you know, and I'm telling the same story about Sammy the Seal and my fear of all the things that I'm gay, right? Like the truth of that, the naming that. And the thing is that no matter what, whenever I name it and say, it, and I did tell the story in Palestine, I did tell the story, uh, you know, for the faculty that when I do that, all of a sudden there's a listening and people are just present to the truth. And then we're all in the same game. And then what happens is, I guess, by my, me naming the shame, it comes to light and it no longer becomes shame because it's no longer festering in silence, but is now seen and heard and dismissed. It's just there. It's in the world. And if not, what happens is it gnaws at me. You know, it's, it, I mean, it's the experience of being in the closet. It's like this hiding you know, do I say it? Do I not say it? Is now the moment? Is it now the, now the moment? You know, what are they going to think? Right? It's all this internal noise, as opposed to an opportunity to actually be present to the conversation that's emerging in the moment, which is not in my head, but actually in the relationship of me with my audience. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and thank you for sharing that story. I think that's it's uh, well, you know, as a as a fellow gay man, um, and uh, uh, you know the. The reality that coming out is uh, is often a daily process, and sometimes it's multiple times a day. And there's always a fear, and there's always that question: Is it safe? Um, and I, and and I know for me, what has been helpful um, is, uh, and that doesn't necessarily take away the fear, but uh, I I used to share my stories uh, about those other those other identities I have because I needed people to hear them. I needed to be supported and loved. And I still need that. And I'm fortunate to get that from people in my life. Now, I, when I choose to share them, I really try to share them with, in the spirit of service. I'm, yeah. I want someone else to feel seen. I want someone else to know they're not alone. I want someone else to see like, hey, this is a person who, even though they, we have a different life experience, they can, they, they can connect with some of the things that challenge, challenge me in my life as another, so. How, the power of it, Brian, you know, you know, when I tell the story of Sammy the Seal in second grade and show and tell and naming Brett MacGyver <laughs> as the, the name of the seal, which was like totally stupid because that's not the name of the seal, it was Sammy the Seal. And that moment of terror, the first moment I tasted terror in speaking in front of my classmates and be like, wow, that was too much. And that was the truth and nobody was ready for the truth. Um, is that even though that in the, in the power of me sharing the specificity of my experience, right? What happens is people relate to the specificity of how, whatever that looked like for them, right? It's not the same moment, but it's what I call the, my big fat Greek wedding approach to storytelling. The reason why my big fat Greek wedding was funny was because it was big, it was fat, and it was Greek. Right. If it was like my random wedding that was nothing happened and everybody was really bland, <laughs> you know, nobody would care. It wouldn't be funny. But in the in the amping up of the Greekness of it, right? I think I located my Cuban family and the craziness of my Cuban family in that story. Right. And we find our own ways into that experience, right? And I think that in the power of sharing the specificity of the identities or the things that you're dealing with, like I think we relate to and we empathize with where we in our lives have felt that. And that's, I think, the power of human connection. I think that that's where we connect. And, uh, and I don't think it's a competition, right? I think sometimes uh, we get into competitive trauma and competitive, uh, which is all about the person. Right, and I think I, I love that what you said is like um, the opportunity to allow your story and the truth to be of service, right? And I think when it really stands in that way, we experience it differently. I think it's it it, it feels generous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel awkward. It feels generous, and I think that that's powerful. 
Yeah, agreed, agreed. Yeah, and, and and naming it, I think, is powerful and building. It, and I I call it uh, uh, when I share when I get in front of groups uh, to uh, for the first time. Um, and sometimes it's it might be even the second time, but then the first time I say, I guess I think a lot of you might be wondering why the white guys up front talking about diversity and inclusion. So let's just <laughs> right. call it what it is and let's talk about it and let's get it off the table. Um, yeah. And and I always one of the first things I say is I know a lot of white guys who want to make the world a better place. Uh, so I want to name that too, uh, and then I share my stories. Yeah. Um, so so we've talked a lot about 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 who who we are, what drives us, and I know that um, that you know this with the, those stories and those passions and those commitments uh, to to serve being the service of others and amplifying others was true for both of us before the pandemic. Okay. And yet the pandemic happened um, yeah. Yeah. and uh, the world happening, it's still happening. It's still <laughs> happening. And, and, uh, and there, and as, as uh, uh, I, you know, I just feel it's, it's coming up for me that I think it's important for us to honor that India is going through. A... Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, Brian, but I just had my second vaccine uh, two days ago and it does feel like, and being on the Island of New York of Manhattan, <laughs> right. It does feel like a little Cancun 1999. I mean, it is like, people are like, I'm out, you know, and, uh, and it's not over, you know, yet again, privilege. Right. And I think that we see the news, we see what's happening in India. We see what's happening in other developing countries. We see what's also happening in, in South America and Brazil, and it's really scary. And I think that um, it's something to measure, I think with this like push to normalcy that's almost happening again, that uh, th th in, in Spanish, uh, my, my family fled Spain because of Franco. So they fled fascism in Spain and then communism in Cuba. Uh, but when Franco died after like a, I mean, it was like a 40 year dictatorship uh, the period of time following his death and when the new uh, government emerged uh, was called El Destape. And El Destape is like when you have like a soda bottle <laughs> and you burst it up and then you open it and it like explodes. Mm -hmm. We're like nearing a Destape, right? Where people are like, everyone wants to be like, I wanna be out, I wanna be playing, I, I wanna be see people, I wanna hug people, I wanna hug everybody. You know, and I think that there's this way in which we're craving the things that we have denied ourselves. And, uh, and it's not over yet, you know? And I mean, we're close, but in some places, but not in others. So anyway, thank you for naming that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It, it felt important. Um, a few minutes ago, so I, I wanna go back. The, the title of our conversation today is Finding Purpose in the Pandemic. Um, and, uh, and so and we mostly- we I thought we didn't talk about that. <laughs> Forty minutes. We're in. gonna make sure it happens. We're gonna, gonna make sure, sure it happens. happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I had a brilliant plan of like, let's talk about who we are and what we believe, and then talking about finding the purpose, and then you know, and we spend a lot of time talking about who, who we are and what we believe, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's okay because I think the the finding purpose in the pandemic is 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 very much connected to that, and mm -hmm. I know for me the uh, you know the as I mentioned earlier a year ago on May sixth. 2020, we launched Hope Heart, and the Human, Hope Heart and the Human Spirit. And I really wanted to call that series Hope Heart and the Human Spirit uh, because uh, at a time that was very painful for so many of us and, and fearful, uh, and um, you know, I felt like that's what we needed. We needed Hope Heart and Human Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that corporate America has long needed Hope Heart and the Human Spirit in very real ways and still does. Um, and so, th so those were some things that emerged for me and have led to opening doors where I can hopefully bring humanity and am, I believe I am bringing humanity to workplaces and organizations, which I'm incredibly grateful for. And as I've said before, more than once, I'm so grateful to you for the final nudge of like, Brian, we're going to we're going to launch Hummingbird and let's make it happen. Um, I, I, I often think like if it weren't for that conversation with Eduardo, what, you know, how long would it would have taken me to like to make it happen? Um, I like to believe that it would have gotten there, but you you played a central role in that. Um, and then and then I, I think about in the early days of the pandemic about how you thought about what you were what you were doing at Fearless Communicators. And that's the other part that I'm also incredibly grateful for is the the um the fearless chats um series i think if i remember the name correctly uh um like i just i looked forward to the i'm like i have to go be with people that lo i love that are just humans um so would you tell us a little bit about how you 
like found purpose in the pandemic? Because I know you did some beautiful things. Well, thank you. Um, I think that the biggest, we found it, so in, in March, early March of 2020, we were in San Francisco running one of our global women's programs. It was a live, it's a live in-person event. It's called Fearless Force Public Speaking for Visionary Women Leaders. Uh, we were gonna be going to Australia three weeks after that to run a program in Sydney. You know, then I was gonna be in Morocco with my best friend who'd been recovering from bone cancer and we were gonna have a little vacation and celebrating him being in remission. And then I had like a family wedding in, in Spain. I mean, it was like the, the, my, my world leading up to pandemic was very global, very travel focused and very um, in the space of our uh, producing our in-person group events. Uh, we, we always had private clients and people that we manage on Zoom. I'd been on Zoom since 2015, since the early days of the business. Uh, and, and so the world stopped and we were in the middle of the program. So we never actually finished that program. We had kind of a soft finish of that program, but we never did a full showcase of our women and their stories. And, uh, and I think what happened is there was like, oh, it was never like kind of like a hard stop, but there was a way in which everything really started slowing down. And I remember uh, it didn't feel safe to go back to New York, which is where I live uh, and privilege and options. I had, I had planned to be in Colorado and it felt better and easier to be in Colorado and honor that trip. I was like, let me get away from the coasts and let me go to the mountains, you know, where there's a lot of air and space and you're not on top of everybody like you are in New York City or San Francisco. So, uh, and then realized really early on that I'm not a homosexual who thrives at altitude. I am a sea level gay. Like I was like, I don't, huffing and puffing at altitude does not really- Hashtag sea level gay. Hashtag sea level gay, right? Not, and sea and sweet gay, but sea level gay, sea level gay. And, uh, and <laughs> I love Brian. Love that too. Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, hashtag C level gay. Uh, so all of like everyone, like everything that was planned, like clients were like, I think I'm going to cancel or I'm going to postpone or I'm going to like everything that we had going just stopped. And um, what I did is I was like, I knew that our community had thought leaders, has thought leaders that think about the things that are most important. So I was like, who knows something that would be of service right now? And we have a woman in our, in our community who is an Eastern medicine practitioner. And she had just written a post. Uh, her mentor had been in Wuhan and had been one of the early responders to people uh, treating uh, COVID patients. Uh, and she, uh, she wrote something called, what else can you do besides washing your hands? And I was like, in the early days, they were like, just, I mean, just wash your hands, put on a mask, wash your hands. But what else can you do? And I thought that that was really rich. And I was like, we're going to have a conversation. We sent it out to everyone on our mailing list. We're going to have Dr. Kelly. And we're going to talk about what else we can do besides washing our hands. And then next week, we're going to talk about, and then it became this immediate way that we could just start centering our thought leaders and people in our community and, and showcase them and let them be of service in the way that their knowledge, their insight, their experiences of service. And we started twice a week doing these, the Fearless Chat series that then eventually turned into once a week, although we were also doing a whole Fearless Chat series called Moving Fearlessly for our Australasian audience. So by the end of the year, we had over 75 virtual events that we hosted. We never sold in them. It was just a, an opportunity to gather community around topics that were of interest. And, and everything was so changing. Like every week, it was like a new thing. You know, we were talking about businesses and pivoting. We were talking about Black Lives Matter and racism. We were talking about mental health and how to cope with it during the mental health pandemic. We were talking about diversity, equity, inclusion. We were talking about parenting and working from home. We were talking about cybersecurity, right? There were all these different things that we were centering. And uh, until it ran its course, and I think everybody was zoomed out and those, that moment kind of passed, uh, but it was a beautiful way of us uh, serving and, and, be, and, and allowing our community and creating a platform to be of service to a greater community. Uh, so that was the, the, the main thing that we did. 
And then uh, I think we also, I discovered that there was, first of all, there's there a way that people talk about pitching, which I find completely uninspiring. So, uh, you know, and, and I've taught elevator pitching and so many people were pivoting businesses or starting new projects and people needed new language about the new world that we were living in and how do we speak about this and how do I speak about this moment? Uh, and, you know, uh, we did a workshop which we called Your Story Now and we tried a model of elevator pitching, which I had done, but didn't feel right. And then literally hours before uh, the second pilot of our Your Story Now program, I was like, I'm making something up and I'm gonna call it a, a stitch. Your story plus your pitch, your stitch. And, uh, and that's what we created. So we created a new program, it's called Your Story Now, where we work with small business owners on the story that's emerging for them now, of greatest service to their audience. Uh, and there's key elements to it that once people know what it is, they can stitch it together and have the agency to stitch it together however they want. And Brian, you participated in that program, which was so great to finally have you uh, be in the in our service, you know, allow us to be of service to you because we're such champions and fans of you. And um, and that was, you know, we've now we we're about to do our ninth program, you know, and we've we've done it in Australia, we've done it in the in in North America, we've had people all over the world participate in the program, and it's been really profound to do that work, and and it felt right to speak into that moment and find a different way of empowering people around the language that's going to propel their ideal audience into action, right? That's at the intersection of storytelling, how we tell powerful stories that are uh, neuroscience-based that like trigger a feeling and an emotion in the audience that's about you, you and your transformation or that of someone who you had the privilege of serving, you know, and how are we disrupting the listening so we stand out from the noise, right? In ways that are true and authentic to who we are. And, uh, and you and we grew like we like we expanded our team. We now have twelve people on our fearless team. We probably we had three before the pandemic, right? So a lot, the majority of the people who are our team members are theater practitioners who've suffered so much during the pandemic, right? So creating opportunities and avenues for them to use their skill set, right? Um, our team has one straight white cisgender male. Everyone else is. LGBTQ plus, woman, BIPOC, right? So um, uh, it's just been a beautiful space of growth. And I think with privilege acknowledging uh, and looking for abundance in the midst of scarcity, right? And when scarcity is just a breath away, how can I reframe that and step into and, uh, and be present to what's possible? Where is their abundance? Where is their fruit? Where is their, where is their green? Where is their uh, plentitude? What am I not seeing? What, what's fertile? And, and that doesn't come from force. That doesn't come from push. That comes from listening. Uh, that comes from feeling. And it really comes from flowing. Where is the energy? And then kind of like attuning to that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's the, a couple things um, spark for me just just hearing you speak and and actually even reflecting on the the theme of our conversation today. So the, the first thing uh, is something you said earlier, just uh, that I wanted to 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 restate, um, and I'll do. I'm going to use my words here. Um, is uh, that allyship? Um, you know, celebrating others, finding ways to to make change in the world. It looks different for each of us, mm -hmm. uh, and it takes the collection of all of those acts, small acts and big acts, and everything in between, to drive change and to make change happen. And uh, and you and I both have similar missions, but we do the work in very through you know very different ways. Um, and I've I've found that with other communities that I've had a chance to work with. Uh, there's a there's a not for profit that I I've been doing some work with over the last year that. Um, they work with uh, helping to um, foster childhood literacy in black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I was talking with some of the members, the, the, the coaches who are educa they're educators, I'm, I realized, wait, we, we're, we have the same goal. We just, we want to make the world a better place for everyone. And it's really beautiful. The other thing that, um, that emerges for me is 
the, uh, you know, finding purpose in the pandemic was what was in inspired my, me for this conversation because I felt like we both did that. Yeah. And what, what I'm also, as we're talking, is that, uh, and, and, and I'm sort of reflecting on what, what we're sharing is, we, we led, led with our hearts and our hearts have led us to find success and to be able to do the things we believe in. Yeah. Um, and you're right, that there is privilege in that and I own that, but I think there's there, there feels like something there of, you know, if back to some of the messages you've shared of be your authentic self and it will it will serve you well. Yeah, I wanna go back because you talked about literacy and I had this beautiful conversation with a gentleman who I interviewed for, uh, a podcast kind of show that I used to run for a co-working space that I used to work at. And it's understanding the framing of literacy from a place that is patriarchal and colonial. Mm. Right? The, the bias is that what I have to do is like your worth is determined by your ability to speak, read, and write in English. Right? And conforming to the rules that are that. Right? And yet, put me in China and I'm illiterate, mm. right? Put me at Gallaudet University in a deaf community and I'm illiterate, right? So it, it reframed literacy mm. for me in also thinking that there's so many ways that we communicate, right? And that they're, and they're all valid. And I think that what I love about, and I, this is what I love about language, right? Is that I think that they're all lenses to understand the complexity of our human experience. And the more languages we have, the closer our understanding is to this experience, which is life, right? And, uh, and I think that, that, I mean, one of the privileges of the work that I do is being with storytellers that are bringing their multiculturalness to it is the richness of that. Like I remember there was one woman, um, well, I, I, I have the privilege right now of, of being of service to a young woman who is from Ghana and is, uh, was a child immigrant to the United States and we're telling her story. And in a typically American kind of biased way, like, you know, which I wanna name for myself, you know, at one point in her story, I said, uh, you know, I'm curious, like when you were home in Ghana, like when you like went to sleep at night, did you dream like of coming to the United States? Did you, what did you dream as possible for yourself? Like, what did you dream about in the way that in our own minds, like we imagine like, you know, this little child in Africa was dreaming of being an astronaut and then came to the United States, you know, and then went to engineering school and now is on the rocket ship going to like that. Those are the narratives that we have underdoggy framed, right? And the truth is, you know, she was, uh, her mother died when she was very young. She was raised by a stepmother with two step siblings uh, who were abusive to her. Her father was completely absent. At 13, she was sold into child marriage. She was raped by the man who uh, was uh, her husband. He had two other wives, 15 other children. She gave birth to a child. And when I asked her that question, I asked her, to speak to it in her own language. Mm. And she spoke in her own language for about a minute. And the gist of it was like, I had no dreams. And hearing that, even though I don't speak her language, hearing the truth communicated from the body, soul, spirit, language, texture, fabric of her native tongue, right? Was heartbreaking, gut-wrenching and profound, right? And uh, it is an opportunity to think about communication, like dance is communication, movement is communication, right? Um, it's not parallel sentence structure and you know indirect object and right and and i think i think we can continue to look for the ands in that and i just felt compelled and honored uh uh to bring that in in this conversation yeah i love that i love that and i also love um what is what it has been in the time that i've had the the fortune to know you uh mm -hmm. the one of the very consistent um 
realities of knowing you is you always come back to the voice of, of, of whether it's your voice of your stories or the voices of others. Uh, and, and having been in the in spaces with some of those, those beautiful humans, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, it's wonderful to see how their stories come to life um, mm -hmm. and through, through the fearless team. One thing that, that I, um, as we're, we're in our last couple, few minutes here, um, and there, this, this could be a whole nother hour long conversation uh, that it, what, the question I'm about to ask, um, when, when, you know, we've talked about um, the, the work that we do and, and what we've learned um, over the last year and, and how leading with heart and purpose has, has led to beautiful, wonderful things. Um, and some of those are success, and, but I think they're also, we're helping others and like, that's beautiful. I, I really, um, as you know, I'm passionate about humanity in the workplace. Uh, and uh, something you said to me recently was uh, that the uh, the patriarchal culture makes humans act like machines or treats humans like machines. Um, and that um, and that the pandemic really forced companies to mm -hmm. see the that their bodies of people like actually, oh wait, there's humans that work here and we have to, um, we have to engage them um, as such. So what I, I'm, what, what, as you think about the, the lessons that, that you've learned and what you believe in, what are, what are your hopes for what the larger sort of world of corporate America um, will, will take from, from this time? Or um, what would you challenge uh, corporate leaders to think about? Well, I think one thing that's really powerful to name is that what happened is, and I think there've been moments in time where it's happened collectively, we just have these, right? So we're able to track it in a way that's different. Like there was a great flu pandemic or there were like, like certain things that have happened through time. Um, but what was fascinating about, you know, as an American, I can think about moments in time that like are markers for me, like the Challenger disaster in 1986. Like I remember where I was when that happened. Like I remember I was in New York City on September 11th, like another moment where I remember like a specific moment in time where something happened, right? And I think for different countries, I'll, I'll always remember January 6th and the, uh, the storming of the, of the Capitol building, right? There are moments that are like such dissonances to our experience that, that they kind of are ingrained and, and, and we can come back and and hearken to, there was a moment in time when something happened and we were all somewhere when something happened. But the thing about the pandemic is that it was universal. It impacted people in Italy and South Africa and Australia and New Zealand and Colombia and Brazil and Canada and the United States and the UK and Spain and Morocco and Egypt, right? It happened everywhere. So there was this moment of collective human pain. And I think what we were present to and suffering, right? And I think that suffering and the ability to feel pain is a profoundly human experience. And I think what happened is, and I think the term vulnerability is thrown around and people think that vulnerability is oversharing or dumping trauma and all that other stuff, which is not that. But I believe vulnerability is the willingness to invite people to witness you struggle. And what happened is there was a collective witnessing because we were all struggling and there was no way out of getting that we were all struggling. And I think it forced us to see colleagues, not just as colleagues, and collaborators and coworkers, but people. People who were really struggling and really scared and really confused and trying to do the best that they could, right? And I think that the companies and the, organiz the organizations that did it right acknowledge that. And then what happened is we had the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and then the Black Lives Matter, I think forced the hand even more. So for the, the people who weren't doing that, then all of a sudden that upswell made it even more uh, relevant and powerful for people to actually really disrupt and actually be in a space of what the fuck is actually really happening, right? And, uh, and an opportunity, opportunity, I think, to actually uh, see, feel, hear, uh, accept 
responsibility where responsibility needs to be accepted, shift and change the things that aren't working, uh, create the spaces for people to actually really communicate the truth of their experience. And I think really try to build spaces uh, that are truly inclusive of all. And, um, and I think that, uh, I remember that, that, that there, 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 was, there, there was comfort in the collective pain because we were all feeling it, right? And I think that that uh, was a great human, and I, I hope we don't forget it. it. At our peril, we forget it. Um, and I think human history has a tendency to forget, and it will be at our peril that we forget it. And we need to remember. And I and I think the uh, we really do need to remember. I think it's important. I think uh, the uh, the other part of that is that there are layers to those stories as well. Um, and you know, as we've talked about, there's privilege, um, and it's not the pain Olympics, as Kenji Yoshino oh. says. Uh, and, and uh, and there are pains and there are pain and challenges that might be really challenging and deep and um, and we've learned a lot about the the disparities in our communities. Yes. It's of course I love our conversations. I'm so glad. To, thanks for everyone for joining us today. How does how is it already an hour past? Um, oh. Eduardo, you know I'm a huge fan. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you for uh, for for being the first guest on Hummingbird hour as well as Hope Heart and Human Spirit. Yes. So as we as we wrap up and say goodbye to everyone, I would like to give you the, the final word. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing that I would love is for people to invite curiosity um, in their own experience and life and thinking about where can I uh, do better, right? Like an opportunity to be really in relationship to that. And, uh, um, and with humility, right and know that it's, it, that there's it's sometimes uncomfortable and that's okay right and uh and the other thing is that uh there's a community of people who are on the journey with you uh fellow hummingbirds humming humming birding their way oh, hum <laughs> hummingbirds that are humming their way backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards you know that are doing their best to um uh to shift culture companies, uh, the way people, uh, the way things move and operate. Uh, and the last thing that I have is an, an invitation, which is, uh, you know, every, the first Thursday of every month, we host an event called the Thought Leadership Forum, which is an opportunity for people to center their own thought leadership, elevate their skills, and then also intentionally network with other diverse global thought leaders. And uh, it's really exciting and loving. Uh, they're an hour and a half and, uh, and a beautiful opportunity to be in relationship with some of the things that we've talked about and how we can continue to amplify our own voice in service of others. So Brian, uh, I'm sure you'll share it with people. There's a bit.ly link, which is fearless, TLF, capital F, capital TLF. No one's gonna remember that, <laughs> but it'll go out in the email and we'll put it in a space that's visible so for people to join we would love to see you. And again, uh, till then remember to fear less, speak free. And when that happens, you end up loving more. I love that, I love that. Curiosity, humility, uh, connection, community. Uh, I love those, those final words. Thank you, Eduardo. And thanks everyone for being with us today. Fear less, speak free, love more. Bye everyone.